Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Darius Beckham. I am a class of 2019 uh, graduate from the University of Dayton, um, formerly um, a student within uh, Dr. Devine's uh, American Presidency class. So um, I think today would be interest today will be interesting, especially considering the fact that um, I get to uh, go back over um, how great that class was and, and look at the work that's currently being done um, with his current students. Um, so I have a, just a few things to go over before we begin. Uh, this is the first in a new series of webinars this year uh, titled Uniquely UD. Uh, we are recording this conversation, so it will be posted on U Digital and made available to the public. Uh, today's session will focus on what qualities make for a successful presidency um, and a project students uh, from the political science department worked on to measure uh, the qualities that they thought uh, were most valuable in a president. Um, as I said, I took this class myself when I was a student, so very much looking forward to uh, this conversation. Uh, there will be an opportunity at the end for questions and answers, so please feel free to type them in the Q&A tab um, that you should see at the bottom of your screen. Um, we did receive several questions in advance at the time of registration, so we will try to address those as well. Um, we'd like to keep the focus on uh, the questions uh, most pertinent to the class and the student's project. I'm joined today by Assistant Professor of Political Science, uh, Dr. Chris Devine, um, and senior at the University of Dayton, Sophia Giles. Uh, Professor Devine earned his PhD at the Ohio State University. Uh, he's a leading expert on vice presidential candidates and is co-author of two books on the topic, Do Running Mates Matter? The Influence of Vice Presidential Candidates in Presidential Elections and the Vice President, and, and the VP Advantage, um, How Running Mates Influence Home State Voting in Presidential Elections. Um, his research has been featured in numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, a Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, and NPR. Uh, Sophia is a senior from Dublin, Ohio, and is majoring in political science and international studies and minoring in Spanish. On campus, she is a lifeguard supervisor of scheduling and special events at the RecPlex and is a academic chair for Phi Alpha Delta Pre-Law Fraternity and is co-president of the Human Rights Week Committee. Now, she is currently interning as a project coordinator for a project within the State Department. I should tell you just a little bit about myself. I won't go through the list of things that I did on campus. It's um, overly long, but um, I currently am Mayor Whaley's legislative aide. Um, that's what I've been doing since I graduated. Um, and that's what I will be doing until she leaves office. So just adding that in there before we begin. Um, at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the mic over to uh, Dr. Devon. Thank you, Darius, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thank you so much to you, Darius, to Sophie, uh, for taking time. I know you have a lot to do in your professional, your academic lives, and uh, you're giving some of your time to be here and prepare for this. And I really appreciate that. I also want to uh, thank uh, everyone who helped to make this event possible, uh, particularly to uh, Jessica Paprocki, Director of Advancement Events, and to uh, Danielle Zimmerman, Assistant Director of Alumni and Constituent Relations. Uh, Stacey Baker as well, helping to facilitate this today. I wanna to thank all of you for being here, uh, taking time in your busy schedule to think about what it means to be a UD student, uh, to think about the presidency and current events and, and all this. It's great of you to be here and, and I hope to make your time uh, worthwhile. You know, when I, I was first asked to, uh, to do, uh, actually, right, yeah, let me share my screen, do a little, PowerPoint for you. Um, when, I was, when I was first asked to do this, I knew we'd want to do something around this time period. I think that's why uh, the uh, folks reached reach out to me uh, about doing an event that would have to do with the presidency for obvious reasons. I mean, we all knew January 19th, we're looking at presidential inauguration the next day, which is the official beginning of a new presidency, but it's also the end of another presidency, President Trump's presidency. So it's a time to not just think about what comes next, but also to reflect on presidential legacies. And it seemed to me that um, the most appropriate way to tackle that, uh, you know, how do we think about the, the start of a new presidency, the end of a presidency, for me at least, was to think about this project. Um, I love the presidency. This is uh, my, I think it's fair to call it my obsession. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I try to go to every presidential home and museum. That's one of my life goals. I'm at 29 right now. 
uh, that, that I've been to. Uh, my wife has joined me for many of those, my kids uh, as well. <clears throat> um, you can often find me reading a presidential biography. I just finished one on Calvin Coolidge. I'm reading one on, on First Lady Betty Ford right now. Um, and all my kids are named after presidents. We have Hayes, Wilson, Madison, and McKinley. So I think it's fair to say I really am interested in the presidency. Um, but this course, not just for that reason, this course is my favorite course that I teach at UD. And this project that I'm gonna tell you about today, I think really captures not just what we do in that course, but really what we try to do at UD as a whole. In short, what this project is, is uh, students coming up with a system for rating presidents, for saying what a great president is. Successful president, as I've labeled it here, but we usually refer to it as what makes for a great president. I was just hearing about a poll today um, that had just come out about Americans saying whether President Trump was above average or a great president, was he below average or one of the worst. Um, we often have this discussion. In fact, it's something that you see even from you know, pretty credible sources here. We have uh, the C-SPAN ratings. You may have seen these in the past or at least heard some of the results. According to historians, according, according to experts, uh, political scientists as well, um, who are the greatest presidents? We see lists like this. Well, let me use this as an example to say, in my classes and I think at UD as a whole, the goal as I often describe it to students, and I hope those of you who are alums can relate to this, my goal when having these discussions is not to tell students, here's the truth, here's what the experts say, download this information, repeat it back to me. How is that preparing you for academic success, for professional success, to simply memorize the conclusions that other people have given you? To me, that's not the goal. We wanna develop critical thinkers. My goal is not to tell you what to think, but how to think. How to think systematically, how to think critically, in a way that you could justify, that you could defend to other people. When you say, in your opinion, who is the best president or how great of a president was this one or that one? Can you explain what it took to reach that? Can you explain the criteria you used? How you weight those different criteria? What counts you know, more than, more than another? Do they all count equally? Um, and in fact, as we look at this very professional, very famous rating, as I, I walk through with my students in the presidency class, um, you know, if you, if you go to the website here, look at how they actually do the rating, it's surprisingly thin. They list 10 categories. There is no place I've ever been able to find where C-SPAN defines what, for instance, you can see a couple of the characteristics down here, public persuasion and crisis leadership. They don't define what that means and they automatically weight them all equally. There are 10 criteria, 10% each. Is that justified? Does international relations, foreign affairs, should that count equally with administrative skills? How do we factor in equal justice for all, which is one of the C-SPAN categories? Does that count equally more or less versus some other factor? These are the things I want students to think about. The whole point is to put the ball in their court and say, what matters to you? And that's particularly important because, you know, this is a course that uh, is usually mostly seniors, uh, as Darius was when he took it, sometimes juniors. Sophie was a junior when she took it. A mix of juniors and seniors, really, mostly seniors, though. So I have folks that's usually in the spring semester, while they're taking the course, they're also applying for jobs, applying to law school, other graduate studies, uh, internships, um, other opportunities. And so part of the function of this, and one reason, again, why I wanna look beyond just the immediate course, I wanna reference something beyond just the presidency in this discussion with you today. One of the things I stress with the students is to think about leadership. The president of the United States is our most visible day-to-day -day leader as Americans. So when we talk about presidential leadership and what makes a president great or not great, in many ways, we're talking about what makes for a great leader. As you go into your work life and you have a boss who's a leader, uh, as maybe you take on a leadership role, maybe you even get into politics, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a community leadership role. What about being a mentor, being a parent? Leadership is something that, you know, we do in our, our lives in a variety of ways. And I think it's important before, you know, exiting from, from UD to pause and think about what makes for great leadership. For example, is leadership all about results? the bottom line, or does character count too? 
Um, what about uh, in terms of, of, you know, achieving success? Is it all about imposing the leader's will on others? Or to what extent is it also getting others to want to work with you, to cooperate with them? I don't pretend to give students answers on this. My objective is to pause and think about it so they can develop their own conclusions once they be able to defend. And these are lessons I think that go beyond the classroom. And that's part of the point of it. So let me talk a little about this project. I'm not gonna walk you through every little detail of this. Don't be alarmed by, by this, but I want to give you at least some opening sense of what the project itself looks like. Here are the instructions. Uh, as, as Sophie and Darius could tell you, the instructions are much longer. Um, <laughs> but but uh, you know, walk you through kind of the point of this and you see some of the opening stuff, the overview, the guiding question, what makes the present great and so on. This opportunity to uh, put into practice, by the way, political science, social science. One thing I also emphasize with students is in this line of study, it's really, I think a lot of people misunderstand this if they're not in discipline, it's not about what your opinion is on this. Like, well, I just feel like Woodrow Wilson was a great or a terrible president. Can you justify it? What's the system that you use to reach that conclusion? Could you justify the way that you're measuring it? It's a three-part project. It lasts over most of the semester and it begins with this. This is a template that I give to students. What they come up with should end up looking something like this. The first part, this is step one of the project to develop your rating system. And, and folks, as you're listening to this, I hope you're looking at lists like this or other ones that I'll show and think to yourself, wait a minute, where's, why isn't this on the list? Why is that one on the list? Why is it worth this much? Why is it worth that much? Um, this is not a, a, my official rating system, by the way. This is just an example, just of what it could look like. So what I ask students to do is to first come up with the criteria that they would use, the categories for rating a president. And on each of those, they say, what would be a low versus a high score? What's the range of that? And very importantly, how much does it count for? I mentioned C-SPAN just automatically counts everything the same. Every category is equal to another. Should that be the case? Should GDP growth and international relations and congressional relations all be the same? What about moral leadership and so on? So that's what students do is to come up with this list and also to define what those things mean. What does congressional relations mean? We can all grasp that as a general concept, but if you were to systematically you know, come up with a rating, uh, a rating project, how would you define congressional relations? Even say, what are some indicators of success, as you can see here? I'm gonna do a brief version of this. There's much more I could say, and, and we can get to it in, in your questions, but let me just introduce that. That's what students start with. And then we move to the next two steps. So the first one is that we all rate one president together based on the same material, okay? We start off with President William Howard Taft. Um, we use this book here, The Bully Pulpit by Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, it's a very long book, 750 pages. We pick out the Taft parts uh, and just read those, goes over his life, his presidency. And uh, we use that to collect information, to collect evidence whereby we could apply that rating system we already came up with. It's not President Taft's rating system. It's supposed to apply to every president. And so once they read this book, they use their criteria, their measurement system, to rate President Taft. You see this picture also, uh, this is in 2019. Unfortunately, we had to cancel uh, the trip last year. We weren't able to do this because of COVID, um, but we actually go to the, and there's one reason I choose William Howard Taft. We go to the William Howard Taft National Historic Site in Cincinnati. And you may notice here our special guest, uh, my colleague, Governor Bob Taft, former Ohio governor, who is of course the great grandson of William Howard Taft. So we use the book and we use the, information from the uh, the home to collect evidence and then students write a paper applying that to rate President Taft. One interesting thing about this, here's the actual spread. This was from last year, so not Darius's year, but from Sophie's year. Um, this is the spread of ratings of President Taft. And one thing this shows you, look, we're using the same source. Students are doing the same reading, but different people value different things in leadership, presidential leadership. They weight them differently. They define them differently. They apply evidence differently. I don't think anyone really has an ideological ax to grind or a partisan ax to grind about William Howard Taft. He's well enough into history. What this really shows you is that people can honestly 
thoughtfully come to different conclusions about a president's performance, depending on how they define, you know, what a successful president is. So that's step two. Step three, the final step is our final paper. Here what I do, and this builds off a of project actually when I was an undergrad and, and, and uh, my favorite class was presidency and, and we got to read a book about a president, something I didn't, hadn't really done before. And I thought, you know, who would I choose to, to, to read about? So for this final project, instead of reading the same material, students choose whichever present they want and whichever book about it. I give them a list that they can think of. In this case, just to give you some examples, here we have Darius's book here. It's gonna tell you a little about uh, President Kennedy. We have uh, Sophie read about President Reagan. For whatever reason you want, and by the way, I'll often I encourage students to choose someone who's more obscure, to choose someone who's not of your political party, to go outside the box, it's up to them. They get to read about a president that they want, and then they apply their rating system. I should mention, in between having applied this to President Taft, I asked students to revise their system. That's an important thing, too, about social science work, about our work in general, is never to think that your first attempt is going to be your best one. I build in revision to the process to learn from it, not just from my feedback, but from other students, from the students thinking, their own evaluation of their work. Maybe they went to apply a crit criteria and it, eh, I hadn't really defined what I was trying to get at. Okay, take another shot. This is actually the, the rating, um, uh, the ratings for 2019, again, Darius's uh, class in this case. I, I, I should mention, you know, most cases, one student was doing this rating. There were a couple where, where two students had the same president. Um, so this is a snapshot. Some of them work out as you might expect. Some of the presidents who typically score low, uh, students scored them low, some typically score high, the same. Some might be a little surprising. And you see some variation here, are last year's ratings. Uh, Miller Fillmore did a lot better this year than he had the year before. Uh, you know, sometimes that might depend on the individual student and, and various things going on there. But, you know, by and large, we see some stability with overall ratings. But the point is, no one told students to give this rating. They came up with a system prior and then they applied it based on the evidence. That's the goal. That's the critical thinking. That's not just consuming information, memorizing things that other people have told you, but it's coming to your own conclusions in a way that you could defend after a lot of thought and a lot of work. And I think ultimately that makes it a really rewarding project. So as I get ready to turn it over to Sophie, who's gonna tell us about her uh, paper on, on uh, President Taft, and, and, and then uh, Darius telling us about uh, President Kennedy. One thing I hope all of you will think about is not just which president you already think is great, but what are your criteria as you evaluate the outgoing President Trump, as you evaluate the in, incoming President Biden, rather than just basing things on partisanship or kind of general feelings about someone, is there a set of criteria that you could defend and apply equally to all presidents that really leads you to that conclusion about how good or bad a given president is. And what does that say about how you think about leadership, what you value in a leader as you act as a leader, as others are leaders uh, in your life? Okay, I will stop there, turn it over to Sophie to tell us about um, President Taft. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like Darius said earlier, my name is Sophia Giles and I am a senior here at UD. Um, I took Dr. Devine's American presidency class last spring. Unfortunately, we got sent home in March uh, due to the pandemic. So the semester looked a little different. Um, we didn't get to go on the field trip like Dr. Devine said, but nevertheless, uh, his class was one of the favorites I have taken at the University of Dayton. Um, and it was largely due to this rating system project that we worked on. Um, yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, like Dr. Devine explained, we were tasked with deciding what constitutes a successful president and how we measure that along with uh, weighting each criterion differently. Uh, the task seemed daunting at first, um, but Dr. Devine gave us everything we needed to set us up for success um, by explaining the rating system process, giving us examples such as C-SPAN and providing articles for us to use in our project. Uh, but he ultimately left the decision-making process up to us. Um, my rating system, as you can see here, consisted of nine criteria that I felt were important for a president to possess in order to be successful. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. We just don't have that much time. But I wanted to point out my decision-making process on a um, couple of the highest weighted criteria. 
Uh, the first is international relations. Uh, because I'm also studying international studies as a double major, um, I find how the rest of the world sees the US and its relationships with countries as an important indicator of the country and the president's success. Um, so I gave it the highest weight. I split this up into um, two different categories, soft power and hard power, which was a concept that I learned in my international relations classes. So I loved getting the opportunity to incorporate that in to my political science classes. Um, if you guys don't know, soft power is um, when a country's policies or participation in international events kind of creates strong relationships with other countries um, and gives that country a status that as a leader in the international community and um, makes like countries, foreign countries willing to work with um, this, with the United States um, in this sense. And then hard power is more of the traditional sense of um, power as in strength and um, success and conflicts and in that area. Um, the other two most highly weighted criteria were domestic policies such as uh, both like fiscal and social policies and congressional relations, um, which I saw as extremely important because being able to work with Congress, being able to work with members of, the bo of both parties um, really showed how if that president was successful in passing policies and cooperating. Um, and I saw that as an important aspect of the presidency. Um, for example, with President Taft, I gave him um, a four out of five in the congressional relations criterion because he made an effort to um, invite Congress to dinners and to um, the presidential yacht um, to work with them and discuss policies. And he also formally thanked members of the Democratic Party, his opposite party, um, when he passed a reciprocity bill regarding trade with Canada. Um, I saw that as extremely making, extremely important in making an effort to um, work together and like pass policies that are best both within the United States and with other countries. Uh, lastly, I took this class as an honors course. Uh, so for those of us who did, our last part of the project was to compare our rating system and how TAF did in our rating system with an actual system, in this case C-SPAN, which you can see here. Uh, my overall score was 63 out of 100, and uh, C-SPAN score is 52.8 out of 100, which I was surprised to find that I was pretty close to them. Um, and I found out the biggest differences were because I weighted my scores differently based on how I felt they were important, such as international relations compared to uh, vision and agenda setting, and they theirs was uh, weighted entirely the same. But if I corrected for that, I actually found that my score was quite close to C-SPAN's. And for me, this um, was important to see, and I really enjoyed getting the chance to do it as an honor student, because it gave me the opportunity to compare my analytical and decision-making skills to that of professionals and the historians who make these rating systems on C-SPAN, um, especially because like this was all on our own. Um, and this was based on our research and how we thought he performed. Um, overall, much of college as a political science major is spent writing research papers about various topics. So I appreciated the opportunity to take what we learned through this class and like make it our own through these rating systems. Thank you, and I will pass it on to Darius. Thanks, Sophia. Um, as uh, Dr. Devon said, I went ahead and went with uh, John F. Kennedy um, when I was in his class. I won't spend too much time on this. I did write this paper two years ago now, but I do just wanna briefly walk you through uh, my rating system. Um, if we can go down to the um, chart where I actually show the score that I gave President Kennedy. Perfect, here we are. <clears throat> so as you can see uh, down at the bottom, I ended up giving him a total of uh, 71.75. That was actually shocking for me. One thing that I'll say about this whole um, pr 
process and uh, this assignment was, it was really revealing, uh, not just to read Richard, Richard Reeves, uh, a profile in power um, of JFK, but to really come up with my own system um, and learn um, what type of president JFK actually was. I think he's remembered, he's uh, remembered very favorably. And I write about that in my paper, but it's another thing to actually um, kind of dig in and get down into um, what type of president he actually was. I tried to be as fair as possible, considering that, you know, his presidency was short lived. Um, but as you can see, um, these are the things that was important that were important to me. Um, communication skills, domestic accomplishments, um, handling of the economy, uh, foreign policy. You see a five there, uh, most notably because of the Cuban Missile Crisis situation um, and just some of the other um, um, events that occurred during his presidency and how he kind of struggled to get control of, of those situations. Um, ability to compromise ethical leadership and crisis leadership. Um, one of the things that I'll also just shortly note is, um, I think I put this under um, ethical leadership. It shocked me that, um, and Richard Reeves writes about this in his book, that even though President Kennedy served uh, before Lyndon Johnson and during the civil rights era, he privately thought um, civil rights was peripheral to um, foreign policy. Um, and of course, he was not public about that, but um, he did lay the groundwork for the civil rights bill that Lyndon B. Johnson passed. He probably would have gotten credit for it um, if he would have lived. But I thought that was really revealing. And I took that and many other uh, insights into my considerations um, during um, my rating system. One thing that I will say I would change if I were to write this paper again today is crisis leadership. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I served as Mayor Whaley's legislative aide for the past 18 months. Um, I started shortly after I graduated. Um, you don't have to live in Dayton to realize that there has been numerous crises in our city over the past two years. Um, it's kind of funny. The mayor uh, has said since the start of COVID that this is um, different considering that everybody's in this crisis. Um, whereas the crisis that we were dealing with before, whether um, it was uh, tornadoes, um, a hate rally downtown, um, the Oregon district shooting, uh, those were all, you know, unique and specific to us. And uh, the city had to deal with them kind of on our own. Um, COVID is a different crisis because the world uh, is going through them. So I would change my rating system here. I think crisis leadership um, is extremely, extremely important. If you're lucky and you don't have a crisis um, during your, you know, your time in office, then that's a miracle because uh, no matter big and small, big or small, um, crises are almost inevitable. So being able to sit um, in, you know, uh, my position as legislative aide during the crisis that Dayton has experienced in the past year, um, has really changed my perception on just how I, how I view crisis leadership. I really think it can make a break, um, you know, a leader, how they withstand um, situations um, that, that are really um, tough and difficult and challenging. So um, that's a little bit about my um, rating system. Um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and move into the Q&A part of um, today's uh, event. Uh, I will say since we first planned this program, uh, much has of course transpired uh, in our nation's capital. Um, we have received some questions surrounding those events, uh, but for purposes, for purposes here today, we'd like to keep the focus on questions related to the class um, and the students' projects. Uh, so if you do have questions, feel free to add those to the Q&A. We did receive some in advance. Um, so I will start um, with those. Uh, the first question is, how important is empathy as a quality a president should possess? In the spirit of take, letting students take the lead, do you want to try that, Sophie, or, or should I go after it? I, I'd like you to do it if you're comfortable. Uh, yeah, I can answer this question. Uh, for me, although empathy uh, was not directly a criterion within my rating system, I find it to be extremely important. 
uh, like Darius touched on with crisis leadership. Um, in my rating system, I had crisis leadership with, I believe, 15%. Uh, so it was one of the highest rated ones. And with this is being able to communicate with those not with those affected by the crisis and with the nation as a whole and be able to um, relate and kind of comfort them at times. Um, during the class, we also read parts of um, President Bush's book. Um, and after 9-11, he gave this unbelievable speech um, that kind of inspired the nation. And I believe that, that having that ability to kind of uh, bring the country together is extremely important. I agree. I would, I would add, um, so it, it kind of works on two uh, dimensions, empathy. Um, in one sense, we want our presidents to be these incredible leaders, these, you know, supermen, superwomen um, in, in some ways. But part of that is not just being good at their job and being super smart and all that kind of stuff, but also being human. We want someone who's human, uh, someone who understands what we're going through. And um, I would say that there's an element there, too, of, of not just being a good person. You know, people want to respect the person holding the office, uh, probably gets the head of state role, and not just head of government that we talk about in this class as well. Um, but that also goes to being effective representative. The president is the only person, along with the vice president, who's uh, elected by the nation as a whole. And uh, so there's an important representative component of being a president. How do you represent people if you don't understand what they're going through? Um, it helps a president to understand what people are concerned about, what kind of solutions they want, what should be highest on the priority list, and, and so on. Uh, so I think empathy goes towards that end uh, as well. Thank you both. Uh, this next question is a bit of a two-part question. Uh, do you believe the rating scale developed by students accurately refl reflects the wishes of the majority of the U.S. electorate? Uh, does it skew to the desires of one political party or tendency? What if two voters prefer opposite values? That's, that's a great question. I'll take a shot at that. So um, first of all, I don't think that many people pause to think about what their criteria are or how they should be weighted or any of that kind of stuff. Um, in so many ways, it's not just that partisanship can influence how people, I mean, obviously, if you ask about President Trump's presidency, Obama, Bush, and so on, you know, a lot of that's going to be colored by partisanship. But also we're influenced by, like I was just showing, the historical rankings. The sense that, well, we all know that Millard Fillmore was a terrible president. We saw, you know, one of the students actually thought he was a pretty good president. And, and I've read about the same biography on Fillmore. I don't know he's that high, but I don't think he's as bad as people often think. Just, that's just one example, okay? So <clears throat> do people uh, pause to think about what their standards are, or are they reacting to kind of this consensus that absorbed about certain presidents? You know, can good, Fillmore's really bad, whatever. Um, so that's one, one thing that I'd say. Uh, but certainly, uh, not just party, because if we go back, further back in history, party's not as much of an issue. If we're talking about a Whig president or something, right? Um, but ideology can influence how people approach this. Um, you know, just in brief, what I would say to that, first of all, we have a, a variety of students, variety of political perspectives. Um, I, I think uh, UD, as far as I can gauge, is probably more balanced politically than a number of other universities one way or, or the other. Uh, maybe uh, students here have, have some thoughts on that. But um, aside from that, just for the individual student, uh, you know, one part of the discussion, we have a lot of discussion leading up to this process. We really think through a variety of things. But one of the points I make to students is to think about whether this is a system that you could defend to people who don't share your political views. Is it a universal system? Or is it just representing your worldview? Um, I try to discourage writing up criteria, for instance, um, that are loaded towards one political ideology. But I do tell students, if they can really justify and defend that you know, someone taking a liberal set of policies or conservative set of policies really does make presidential greatness, they would argue that to the end, respectfully to someone who doesn't share that ideological view, if they really genuinely feel like that is what makes a great president, that's their choice. I ask them to think about it, to really think about it and be ready to defend it. But if that's what they ultimately believe in, it's their project and they can do that. That's my approach. 
Sophia, do you have anything you want to add on this? Yeah, I would just say from a personal experience, I tried my best um, to kind of, I mean, it's impossible. There's always going to be some type of um, subjectivity, uh, but I always really tried to focus on everything as a whole and not just uh, political parties or ideologies or policies that I believed would most benefit the country. Thank you. I'll, I'll weigh in briefly here because that is a really loaded question. Um, that's one thing that I thought while I was doing this project two years ago, and that's one thing that I was reminded of today. This this rating system, the process, the actual um, research and reading that goes into actually knowing uh, what a president did and how he um, operated during his time in office, that's not something that the average person bases their political opinions on. Um, and it'd be really nice um, if you were required to do some of this stuff before um, having, you know, heated political discussions about a president, because I think it really, you know, forced people to actually take a good look at, you know, a president's record, um, as opposed to making, you know, political opinions that might not be um, backed up. So, um, you know, despite whether your political, um, you know, leaning is one way or the other, um, to Dr. Devine's point earlier, you know, he's, he's really spot on. I think most people don't have a rating system. You know, they have their party um, and kind of tells you to an extent what your rating system should be. So um, it, it's, it's rare to sit back and think, okay, what's important to me in a president? Um, and, you know, rate that president based on actual uh, detailed accounts. So um, this, this project was really informative, um, not just in the sense that it kind of took the partisan lens off of things, but it just really made you learn about a president and who they were. You know, if I, can I jump in? Can I actually yeah, build off your, your point there, Darius? Sorry to keep it going, but this is really important. Um, I show you the C-SPAN ratings, and this is one of the things we discuss in class. Uh, okay, so these are the experts. These are historians, political scientists who, who rate this. Um, I've been asked to, to do those kinds of ratings for an, another, not for C-SPAN, but for something else before. And, you know, they literally ask you to rate every president. I don't believe everybody who's doing this has read a detailed biography of each president. A lot of times it's based on general knowledge, and Taft is a great example of this. You know, Taft, I, I would generally, we talk about this, I, I generally agree, you know, Taft it was probably better than most people think, uh, but not, you know, one of the greatest. That's fair. But if you look at how C-SPAN historians rated him, some of the things uh, that they rated him highly on, administrative skills, I think is more reflective of his previous service as Secretary of War, his later service as a Supreme Court Chief Justice. Um, his administrative skills, actually, when you read through Goodwin's book, are questionable. He messed up some things in that area. Other areas, of course, Taft was a terrible public speaker. He didn't compare to Teddy Roosevelt. Actually, there's some pretty good evidence he was a, a better communicator than people think. And so I wonder when the, even the historians are rating Taft, and I'm sure this is true of other presidents, if they're going based on probably not partisanship, I don't think that's as much of an issue, especially historically, but the general reputation. So I would just encourage any of you who are, you know, if you're interested in this kind of thing, and obviously you're here today, you know, come up with your system and read about a president and try, take your own shot and then compare it to C-SPAN or others. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're, they're not right. But, um, you know, I wouldn't just assume because something's been done or it's a widespread opinion that it, it must be true. Um, I think that's what you're seeing reflected by, uh, uh, by the alums uh, of the class uh, here today is that they really thought through some of these things and sometimes reach different conclusions, which is, which is great. Yeah, we're, we're going to get to the next question here. This has nothing to do with my rating system, but here's another just very small example of something that is not widely known. P President JFK, handsome guy, he, I think, was uh, presumed to be in great health and, and young and energetic. He had terrible health. And I learned that reading that book that, I mean, he had really, really bad back issues and he'd take painkillers for them constantly and could barely stand up sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so another small thing that you learn when you actually read, um, you know, a, a very thick book about a president. Um, next question. Uh, is there a quantifiable difference between uh, elected presidents and the seven men who have become president as a result of assassination, death or resignation? 
That's a great question. You know what I'm going to do? And, and obviously I'm limited in the time we could uh, spend on this. Normally I like to do a really thorough uh, um, quantitative analysis of these kinds of things, but you could kind of roughly gauge that just by looking at some of these ratings. Uh, you know, we, we see uh, Johnson, Andrew Johnson took over after Lincoln's assassination. He's really low on there. Fillmore after Taylor's uh, death in uh, 1850. Arthur after Garfield's death, um, what, Coolidge uh, after uh, Harding's death, Teddy Roosevelt after McKinley's death, John, uh, Johnson after JFK. So you can see here there, there's a real spread, you know, at, at least according to the student ratings. Um, you could also look at the C-SPAN ones and, and draw some of your own uh, comparisons. Um, but I think it's pretty well spread out. Um, one thing I will say just from experience with, with, with this stuff is that, um, some of that depends on uh, how much uh, of the remainder of that term they get. Uh, for instance, when uh, after JFK's assass assassination, uh, Lyndon Johnson had about a year until the next election, and uh, his theme was to continue JFK's policies, uh, exactly like, like Darius was re referring to with civil rights legislation. Uh, they weren't originally really his policies, not to say he disagreed with them, but they weren't his you know, kind of making. Um, he was carrying on in a second term when he was elected in his own right. You could say the same for Calvin Coolidge. There, they were a little freed up to pursue uh, their own policy. So it'd be interesting, by the way, if you apply this, this system, even breaking down different terms. I guess that could be the, the next version of this project, right? Uh, is to see you might, if you might get some differences um, when accounting for those kinds of factors. So great question. Hard to answer systematically, but that should give you at least a sense of, of you know, the variation in, in how they perform uh, after succeeding to office. Sophia, I want to certainly get you in. Do you have any thoughts that you'd like to add on that? Um, because I didn't research a president who did not become president because of being elected, um, I don't really have much to add, but I will say I think it largely depends on, doesn't like necessarily depend on how they became president, but more of what they did once they became president based on our rating systems. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and ask one last question, one for each. Um, <clears throat> this uh, is a little bit more specific to our panelists today. Uh, Professor Devine, what are you teaching this semester? Uh, this semester I have two sections of the um, uh, 201, which is our American political system, kind of introduction to American politics. Um, I have a course released this semester to focus on some research, uh, so it's a little lighter than it would normally be, but I think handling American politics right now is, is going to be just plenty to fill my schedule to try to keep up with the news. Uh, but just for example, uh, last semester, uh, I taught two sections of our research methods uh, course, which, which uh, both of you have taken, and um, also taught a course on uh, its political parties, campaigns, and elections. A lot to fit in, but we always teach that during the uh, election season, so we'll do it again in the fall of 2020. Two, um, so a wide wide range of, of things, but a little more focused this semester. Thanks. I have uh, taken two classes with Dr. Devine, so uh, if any students are listening and you still, I don't know if registration has already happened or not, but um, regardless, if you're a political science major, certainly sign up for his class. I think you'll enjoy the experience. Um, and then Sophia, you're a senior. Um, what are you thinking about as you near graduation? Um, do you have plans yet? That is the world's greatest question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am currently applying for some jobs, uh, both more on my, focusing more on international relations and um, and some focusing on political science. Um, and I hope to just gain some experience before eventually returning to school and getting a degree in law, hopefully. And I also want to touch on I took. Uh, four of Dr. Devine's classes. I was with him for half of my college career. Um, and so if there are any students listening, I can definitely give you some recommendations. Um, personally, he teaches some of the best classes um, in the political science department, in my opinion. No, you, you have my second. Um, I think Dr. Devine definitely challenged me to uh, be a better political science major. So I appreciate, you know, this opportunity as well and um, best of luck in your future classes. Um, Sophia, 
best of luck in whatever you do post-graduation. Thank you so much. I think we are wrapping up for today. I think Dr. Devine might have one more thing he might want to add. Very quickly. That was so nice what both of you said. I really appreciate that. And let that be a plug, especially to those alums out there. I can say as a professor, the best thing in the world is getting to be in contact with my future or my, my past students to see Darius again. Sophie's still here for, for a little more. Um, but we love, love hearing from you. Please send that email, make that call, stop by when it's safe. Um, we love hearing not just what you're doing, but what you're thinking and and just reminisce, please do that. It's great to see both of you today. Great to be back. Um, thank you, Sophia. Thanks, uh, Dr. Devine. Uh, thanks to everybody that tuned in today. We hope you'll come back and check out the upcoming digital events and uh, hoping everyone has a great rest of their week. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.